I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for being here. This this really becomes quite a social um, event when when everybody gathers like this, and I I can't wait for the time when we can all gather in person. Today's uh, presenter is Steve Sinding. He was the Director General of the International Planned Parenthood Federation in London. He had a 20-year career at the U.S. Agency for International Development and served as Senior Population Advisor to the World Bank and later as Director of the Population Sciences Program at the Rockefeller Foundation. He was Clinical Professor of Public Health at Columbia University. He serves on a number of boards and works as an international consultant. He is also a frequent lecturer of GMAL and other um, organizations. And he moderates the weekly roundtable discussion groups and has moderated the GMAL debate in our pre-pandemic times. It's always a delight to have Steve with us. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much, Gloria. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be back among so many friends. And uh, it is very much an old home week kind of atmosphere. And if Al Felden is still skiing today, it's definitely the end of the winter season. Okay. Um, some of you may recall back, I think it was in 2011, uh, I gave a talk, uh, a Gmail talk at the Maple Street School on population. And I haven't talked on the subject uh, publicly really since then in Vermont or much any place else. So I thought it was time to kind of do an update uh, for those of you who um, may have heard the earlier one, but certainly anybody who's interested in the question, whatever happened to the population, population explosion and, uh, and where are we today? The outline of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to um, explain what the population explosion is or was, uh, its origins, how it started, uh, the, that is the population movement that responded to this perceived population explosion talk about the early years leading up to the first World Population Conference in Bucharest in 1974, which was uh, a seminal event in the field. Um, then talk about a period of great consolidation after the Bucharest Conference, what I call the golden years of family planning, uh, which ended rather abruptly uh, in the 1980s with the onset of the Reagan administration uh, a change in U.S. policy and uh, a few other things that happened uh, around that time. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Population Conference of 1994 in Cairo that really changed the entire perspective on the field uh, and in some respects signaled the end of the movement that had begun uh, 25 or 30 years earlier. Uh, that brings us to where we are today in, in demographic terms, what the, what the world looks like today compared with what it looked like in 1960, <clears throat> and then some concluding thoughts before opening up to um, Q&A. So let's go back to the beginning, and this is a chart that I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, it, uh, it shows the dramatic rise in global population that occurred after millennia of basically uh, zero to, to, to very little growth in population. Up to around 1850, uh, it, it took us from uh, the beginning of, of, uh, of, of human um, presence on the globe to about 1850 to reach the first billion people on earth. It took another century to get to the second billion. And today we are at about uh, 7.8, uh, rapidly approaching 8 billion people on the planet. And you can see with this whale-like uh, figure, um, how that occurred and how rapidly it occurred from 1950 onward. I want to spend a little bit of time on this graphic because it, it has a lot of information packed inside it. And I hope you all can see it well enough to, to follow what I want to say. Uh, it shows the four phases of the population explosion. 
uh, or the boom in, as it's called on the graph. Uh, beginning um, in the pre-industrial era, uh, the era I talked about really up to about the middle of the 19th century, when population didn't grow very much and both birth rates and death rates were very high. Um, couples were having large numbers of children, large numbers of those children did, did, did not survive uh, infancy or childhood. Um, and population remained pretty stable until there came about some really important changes in the death rate. Beginning around 1850, uh, it, it actually started in Europe earlier with the Industrial Revolution, but, but let's say from the middle of the, uh, of the 18th century up, up into the 19th century, um, birth rates uh, and death rates began really to decline quite rapidly, starting in Europe and then spreading uh, elsewhere in the globe. And this had to do both with improved sanitation and healthcare and health systems and also um, a food supply that kept up and even exceeded in, in many generations um, uh, the, uh, the minimal requirements. Uh, but birth rates remained high. And so beginning uh, early in this century, we began to see uh, really quite rapid increases in population growth around the world. Um, what the graph shows is that the gap between the birth rate and the death rate really is when population grows very rapidly. And this shaded area here in the pink shows what happens to population itself as the death rate plummets and as the birth rate follows more slowly. Uh, so that um, toward the end of what demographers call the demographic transition, you see uh, the two lines beginning to converge as the death rate, uh, the, the, the rate in, of decline in the death rate flattens out and as birth rates begin to approach and eventually to uh, reach a new low level equilibrium. Um, and in the bottom of the graph, you see that what this does to the age structure of populations. Uh, in the earliest phases, you have very few people in the old age groups at the top, uh, and the preponderance of people uh, below the age of, uh, of 20, and uh, in many cases below the age of 15. Um, as um, the uh, population boom begins, uh, the pyramid gets fatter, uh, and you still have. Um, a, a very large number of people in the low age groups, uh, but you get more and more people uh, approaching middle age and more and more people getting to the old age groups. As uh, you, you begin to reach the end of the demographic transition, uh, as birth rates really do get lower, you see uh, a flattening at the bottom um, and uh, a bulging upward of, of, the, of the age structure, so that by the time you get to a really mature, uh, stable state population at the end of the transition, uh, it looks more, like, more or less like this. And, and this could very well be the, the age pyramid of Japan today, uh, with relatively few people in the, in the lower age groups, a lot of people in the middle age groups, and really quite a lot of people in the oldest age groups. The, the population movement has been characterized by two great debates. Um, the, the, the first was the debate about whether rapid population growth is uh, a negative factor for a country's development. Um, and there was a very serious debate between uh, beginning really in, in the uh, 18th century with the writings of the Reverend uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, who argued that uh, a, uh, a, the growth in the food supply grows arithmetically while population grows geometrically. And the food supply inevitably will fall behind the growth in human numbers uh, as this goes forward. And, and Malthus was commenting in fact on the growing population in England and Wales that was accompanying the Industrial Revolution, the improvement in health standards and so on. And he looked at the situation, he looked at these very large families that were now surviving 
uh, and said to himself, my God, we're not going to be able to feed these people. Um, on the other hand, uh, there were many who felt that technological improvements and other ways uh, in which human ingenuity would respond would make it possible to always keep up with this larger <clears throat> and growing population. And there were even those who said that a growing population is in fact a sign of uh, a society's health uh, and that the larger a population is and the faster it is growing, the better off that society is. So the, that was the debate about whether. There was uh, later on uh, an equally fierce debate um, about how if one felt that population was growing too rapidly, uh, anything could be done about it. Uh, and the debate about how raged uh, for many years between uh, those who believed that the best approach was to provide birth control and family planning services. Margaret Sanger was foremost perhaps among uh, those who, who argued this position uh, against uh, another group um, who felt that until the circumstances in which couples make decisions about family size changed, uh, they would continue to have very large numbers of children. And what would have to change was their prosperity, the opportunities available to women outside of the home, uh, the rate at which children were surviving as opposed to those who had been dying in large numbers earlier. They said basically that without improved health, without improved education, uh, without improved opportunities for women, outside childbearing and, uh, and, and taking care of the household, uh, fertility would remain very high and people would continue to have large families. So let's now look at the early years of the population movement. <clears throat> there really wasn't much of anything in this field before um, the end of World War II. In the 1930s, John D. Rockefeller III, as an undergraduate at Princeton, did actually write his undergraduate thesis on uh, his concern about population growth. And there were demographers at Princeton in particular at a place called the Office of Population Research, it, it, which was part of the university, uh, who were warning that uh, a, a uh, significant increase uh, in global population was just around the corner. But this wasn't really confirmed until the 1950 round of censuses was conducted. Uh, the war, of course, disrupted everything, including the ability of countries to conduct censuses. Uh, but in 1950, in the years from roughly 1949 to 1952, most countries in the world did conduct censuses. And then by 1950, there was a United Nations with an Office of Population Research headed by a Princeton demographer by the name of Frank Notstein, who had been um, a professor of Rockefeller's uh, at Princeton, that uh, took a look at these censuses and discovered uh, in the early 1950s that there was indeed a population explosion underway. That populations, particularly in Asia, were growing at an extraordinarily rapid rate. Uh, and this was uh, the first be the beginning of a global realization uh, that things were changing uh, on a global basis, on a planetary basis, in ways that they had never changed before. Um, Rockefeller tried very hard to get the Rockefeller Foundation, of which he was the chairman, to take this issue on as a, as a major program area. But because his brother Nelson was very much involved already in New York politics and feared uh, what a Rockefeller Foundation initiative in this field would do in terms of his relationships with Cardinal Spellman. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, chose not to get involved in this area. Um, and so Rockefeller took some of his own money and formed an organization called the Population Council in New York in the, in the year 1952. 1952 was a, a signal year for a couple of other reasons, because that was the year in which Margaret Sanger organized a group of uh, family planning enthusiasts around the world to create the International Planned Parenthood Federation at a meeting in uh, Bombay, then Bombay, now Mumbai, India, 
also in 1952, there were eight original signatories to the uh, founding of, of IPPF. Uh, and also in 1952, India articulated the globe's first population policy, the first national population policy that was ever articulated, a, 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 an expression of a desire to bring India's very high fertility rate under some degree of control. Uh, as I mentioned, the Rockefeller Foundation did, wasn't involved when, J, when John D. III uh, formed the Population Council, but fairly soon thereafter, it and the Ford Foundation began to put significant uh, investments into uh, the field, particularly research and training. Um, and the early leaders of many of the family planning programs in the developing countries really came out of Ford and Rockefeller Foundation fellowships that were established in the 1950s with training mainly at US universities. Uh, and the Population Council uh, carried out a great deal of research in developing countries that documented what was happening to population growth and began to explore the origins of this growth and to look into the questions uh, of whether and how that is as far as those great debates were concerned. Is population growth really a serious problem from the standpoint of national development? Uh, and if so, what can be done about it? Um, <clears throat> moving forward, um, the, the, from the 1950s into the 1960s, uh, I, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, one is that in 1959, uh, President Eisenhower named uh, a presidential commission to look into the broad issues of US national security. It was headed by uh, General William Draper. Um, and uh, General Draper, uh, in the course of carrying out this uh, broad examination of US uh, national uh, security issues, identified rapid population growth in the developing world as an issue. And he advised Eisenhower to begin to use foreign aid to address this problem. Eisenhower thought about that and decided that in fact, this was too controversial an issue and too sensitive a subject for the US government to become involved in. And he rejected that part of the Draper report. But by 1966, uh, thinking in the US government had changed sufficiently uh, that uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, in 1966 articulated the first commitment of the United States to address global population growth as a foreign policy issue. Um, in the late 60s, uh, two important books were also published. The better known of these was Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, which really for the first time popularized the issue of the population explosion in the public uh, consciousness. And William and Paul Paddock uh, a year earlier had published a book called Famine 1975, which predicted that the periodic famines that were particularly being experienced in the countries of South Asia would become much more numerous and much more serious uh, in, a, in a very Malthusian uh, uh, expression um, of the relationship between food supply and population growth. The uh, Nobel laureate, Norman Borlaug, uh, famous for the invention really of the technologies that led to the Green Revolution in agriculture, also in these, in these late 60s and early 70s years, also became a major exponent of the population control message. Um, and uh, soon after uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, commitment of US resources, um, U.S. aid got its first big uh, financial grants uh, via congressional uh, legislation. Uh, interestingly, the author of the uh, first earmark in the AID budget for population was George H.W. Bush, uh, a, a freshman congressman at the time from Texas, uh, who for many years uh, was a major uh, advocate of population issues until he became a member of the Reagan administration, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, 
Also in 1968, a very important thing happened. And this was the establishment of the United Nations Fund for Population Activities, as it was then known now, the Population Fund, um, <clears throat> which brought the UN uh, for the first time in a big way uh, into the field. In 1964, 65, roughly that period, the total uh, fertility rate, that is the average number of children born to a woman during her reproductive lifetime was slightly over six or almost in fact, six and a half children per woman in the developing world. That is across all the continents uh, of, of, of the global South as, uh, as we now sometimes call it. Um, and contraceptive use was really quite limited uh, at, at most at around 10%, that is the use of modern contraception. This in 1965. Okay, uh, let's move forward now to the first international conference on population. Uh, the first World Population Conference was convened largely at the urging of the United States and its allies in Western Europe and Japan, uh, which, uh, which was uh, increasingly concerned with these issues. Uh, it was held in Bucharest in Rom Romania in August of 1974. And at the time, the United States and its allies were pushing for a global target and for countries to establish demographic goals for themselves, pushing very hard uh, for the world to commit itself to lowering the rate of population growth. Uh, the countries of the global South were not ready to sign on to any such proposition. And they were very much egged on by the Soviets and by the Chinese and by the socialist bloc in general, uh, which took the position that um, what the South, what the global South needs was massive aid, not pills and condoms. And in the words of the Indian Minister of Health at the time, Karan Singh, development is the best contraceptive take care of the people and population will take care of itself, it was very much the watchword of Bucharest. Uh, as I say, the Soviets and the Chinese stoked this Marxian position and said that rapid population growth, rather than being a cause of underdevelopment is in fact a symptom of poverty and a symptom of underdevelopment. And they argued exactly the opposite case from the, the, the case being put forward by the, the Western powers and, and Japan. Well, the US and its allies, as I, as I wrote here, were outnumbered and they were outgunned. And with the exception of some Asian countries, the majority of the countries at Bucharest were not ready to accept the need for population control. And also, as I've written here, the, the term population control became a dirty word. Um, in fact, in, in polite company, which is to say at UN conferences, uh, ever since, you never hear that term. Only the Western press uses it. Uh, but in fact, it became a, a, a flashpoint for conflict uh, in international uh, discussions. And there was no resolution at all of either of the great debates. Uh, whether or not population growth was a problem for development, uh, and even if it was what to do about it, there was, there was practically no consensus. But what was decided at Bucharest uh, was a world population plan of action, including the following language. All individuals and couples have the right to determine freely and responsibly the number and spacing of their children and to have the access to the information and the means to do so. This has become the watchword of the population movement since 1974 in the Bucharest Conference. That however you may feel about whether population growth is a problem and however you may feel about whether the family planning approach is the right way to address it, individuals and couples have the right to determine the number and spacing of their children. And this was the license the international family planning movement needed to move forward. And that is exactly what happened. Notwithstanding the politics, the posturing, the rhetoric of Bucharest, many countries around the global South in all of the regions except Sub-Saharan Africa either adopted population policies as India had many years earlier, 
or at least uh, as in the case of Latin America, they encouraged non-governmental organizations to expand access to family planning services. Uh, there was an enormous growth in uh, the availability of family planning services through non-governmental organizations and through commercial channels. Uh, and uh, we began to see through the 70s and particularly as we entered the 80s, very significant increases in contraceptive use in uh, most of the regions of the developing world. The great, the great debates uh, lost some salience and they faded, they, they faded somewhat from view, although they did not disappear. And some of you may recall uh, an, an American uh, economist by the name of Julian Simon, who continued to argue uh, quite persuasively uh, in, in, in some circles uh, that population growth, rather than being uh, a detriment uh, to development or a hindrance to uh, uh, to um, the growth of, of incomes uh, was in fact a, um, a benefit and a boon. <clears throat> in most of the regions, policy translated into expanded public health services. Uh, in uh, all across Asia, uh, from Korea to Pakistan, countries were committing themselves to providing through their public health services family planning services. And the most successful of these, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, and later on Bangladesh, and, and eventually even India, uh, began to see uh, substantial declines in fertility. But there were countries uh, in which uh, those policies uh, involved actual or uh, the perception of coercion. India in the, in the mid 1970s uh, engaged in a program of forced sterilization uh, that in fact brought down Indira Gandhi's government uh, in 1976. Uh, and China, uh, which did a huge flip-flop from its position at Bucharest in the late 70s, uh, articulated the one child policy uh, which it implemented uh, with a great deal of force uh, and was without question the most coercive family planning program on earth. Indonesia also had elements of coercion and even Bangladesh perhaps uh, could be um, characterized in, in that way. By far the largest donor uh, throughout this period, uh, providing some 50% or in some cases, in some years even more of all of the aid for international programs was the United States. Uh, the UN Population Fund, which was the beneficiary of much of this money, but also had funds from across Europe and, uh, and the rest of the industrialized world, and the World Bank uh, were also major uh, contributors to the, the global movement. Um, one of the most important things that happened uh, at this time was the establishment jointly by uh, USAID and uh, the UN Population Fund of the demographic of what was the, initially called the World Fertility Survey and uh, evolved into what is today still operating as demographic and health surveys. The World Fertility Survey was at the time, and I think that the, the, the DHSs are even today, the largest social science undertaking in the world. Uh, these surveys are done regularly um, in uh, almost all countries of the developing world and the industrialized world. And they, they, they paint a picture of demographic change uh, and of improvements in, in health status uh, that we wouldn't possibly otherwise have were it not for these surveys. Uh, it's really what I think one of the most important things uh, that were done and they enabled us not only to understand the problem but also uh, to measure the effectiveness of the programs that were underway to try to address it. As I mentioned, contraceptive use increased dramatically from about 10% in 1965 to over 40% on average uh, by the late 1970s uh, and into the 80s. And uh, these numbers were much higher in much of Asia and in Latin America. And interestingly, the programs uh, 
in Asia and Latin America were really quite different from one another. As I said, the Asian programs were largely public sector programs carried out by governments. Because of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America, governments were hesitant to become involved directly in the provision of services, but they did encourage the non-governmental organizations uh, to become active. They never stood in their way. And in fact, in Latin America, uh, the fertility decline was largely managed by the private sector and the NGO sector as opposed to governments. And I list here the major success stories, Korea, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Asia, Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica in Latin America, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Africa. Uh, countries of North Africa, Tunisia, and Morocco in the Arab world. And of course, China with its one child policy initiated the most rapid decline in fertility in global history. In many of these countries, average fertility declined from its 1965 level of over six children to approach and in some cases actually achieve the replacement level of slightly after two, slightly over two. So these were the golden years of family planning as, I, as I've uh, dubbed them, but there was big trouble brewing. It started in 1984 with the Reagan administration reversing longstanding US policy. The Reagan administration took the position that rapid population growth is not a barrier to social and economic development. They said in, in a statement at the uh, second World Population Conference in Mexico City in 1984, that population is at best a neutral factor, neither positive nor negative. And the Reagan administration enunciated uh, what has become Republican orthodoxy ever since, which was a staunch opposition to, um, to abortion. The US, uh, as a consequence of this uh, shift in policy, retreated from its position of global leadership and this came as a tremendous shock to the global community. With, without US leadership, the population movement, as we saw it develop through the 60s and 70s, simply would not have happened, not at that scale and not with that effectiveness. Um, not long after the Reagan policy shift came the AIDS pandemic. Uh, we knew by the mid to late 1980s that AIDS was in fact a serious pandemic and it overwhelmed all other concerns of health agencies and systems around the world. Resources were redeployed to combat the AIDS pandemic. Uh, and many of these were funds that had been previously provided and devoted to family planning services. <clears throat> um, a third thing that happened was that the environmental movement, which had been in some degree of alliance with population advocates and with the population movement began to move away as they perceived the population, which always had been a controversial issue, uh, was in fact, as far as the Reagan administration was, con was concerned, uh, a, a, an untouchable. Um, and so the environmental movement for political reasons largely uh, began to distance themselves from concern about population growth around the world. Uh, and instead of, of forming the kind of alliance that could have been uh, quite powerful, uh, went their own way uh, in terms of the population question. Interestingly, uh, Congress, which was still largely dominated by the Democrats uh, through these years, maintained high funding for population programs. But as I say here, the absence of a strong voice and the absence of diplomatic pressure led to a real decline in the sense of urgency that had propelled the movement uh, from the 60s onward. Um, another thing that happened and uh, ultimately just as important as all of the ones I've just mentioned was that feminist and human rights groups began to emerge in the 1980s in response to the coercive programs, particularly in Asia, India, as I had mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, China after the one child policy was, uh, was, was uh, promulgated, um, concerned about what they regarded as excessive emphasis on population control as opposed to individual, particularly women's 
health and rights. Uh, the women's health movement uh, and the critics of organized family planning programs gradually gained strength and power through this period. So that by the time of the third uh, decennial World Population Conference, the International Conference on Population and Development at Cairo in 1994, uh, as I wrote here, these groups had captured center stage in the global debates. Um, the Cairo conference was what came to be called a, a, a really serious and significant paradigm shift, uh, a, a complete change in focus from population limitation or management or control, if you will, uh, to programs that needed to be addressed to the rights and the needs of individuals, uh, not to what governments thought should happen to their population growth rates. <clears throat> and the action program that emerged from the Cairo program of action demanded that public programs be organized about re around reproductive health and rights as they was the term of, of that conference, not demographic targets. Which brings us to where we are since Cairo. Uh, absent US leadership since the 1980s, there have been no global conferences on population since 1994. There have been periodic gatherings, uh, mostly called by uh, non-governmental organizations, but the UN has not had a population conference since 1994. Uh, and there has been no uh, coming together of the governments of the world to talk about this issue uh, since that time. Fertility rates, on the other hand, are approaching replacement level almost everywhere except Sub-Saharan Africa. And in some regions, East Asia and Europe in particular, they've fallen well below replacement. There is actually more concern today in most of the world with too low fertility and with population aging that accompanies that. Recall the graph that we looked at early in the presentation. Uh, than with high fertility. And let's just look at a couple of graphics here to demonstrate this. This is what has happened to population growth rates, uh, to, the, to the total fertility rate um, around the world. You can see China, which was at six and a half children per woman uh, in the late 60s, uh, plummeting to today a level below replacement. This is the China today at uh, slightly above one and a half children per woman or well below replacement level. India, uh, which many people have always thought of as the most uh, overpopulated uh, and uh, extreme case of population um, pressure in the world has dropped to just about replacement today. Um, from a high of uh, just under six children per woman in the 1960s. Uh, the US, <clears throat> which was not so uh, low itself uh, during the baby boom, uh, has dropped down to a level below, below replacement level fertility for quite some time, which actually rose for, starting in the 90s and remained right about at replacement until just the last few years when it again has dropped well below replacement. And today one is hearing much more talk in the United States than we ever have before of too low fertility and of a, of a birth dearth. Uh, Germany and, and Japan are, are symbolic of countries which are so far below replacement that they are really deeply concerned about the aging of their populations uh, and the, uh, the, the, the failure of couples to reproduce. And the world as a whole is now really only slightly above the 2.1 level that is regarded by demographers as replacement level fertility. So in every part of the world except Africa, and here you can see the discrepancy, um, the total fertility rate is at a level which is propelling us toward zero population growth somewhere around the middle 
or the, the, the second half of the 21st centuries, uh, 21st century. <clears throat> Sub-Saharan Africa remains very high. In 1980, it was at its peak of almost seven children per woman. That has now declined to somewhere in the neighborhood of five and a half per woman and is on a downward trajectory, but as you can see, much slower and much later than the other developing regions uh, and the world as a whole. So going back to where we are today, climate change and pandemic disease have become the global preoccupations of the day. <clears throat> you very rarely hear people talk any longer understandably so, about global population growth. The focus is on Africa to the extent that there is a focus at all. And the African population growth rates are indeed uh, so high uh, as to be uh, very worrisome uh, for the, the, uh, the, the advocates of, of economic and social development in Africa. I'll come back to that. Um, women's health and rights advocates continue to press for sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, in the international dialogue. Um, and uh, to the extent that there is still a response to the demand for family planning and reproductive health services, it's very much focused on meeting women's needs rather than achieving demographic goals. And this has transformed family planning and related services into one among many desirable social improvements rather than the global imperative that propelled it from the 60s into the early 1990s. There was a time when governments really believed that population control was the most important issue on the global agenda. Nobody is arguing that today. So a few concluding observations. Um, I believe that the international population movement was one of the great success stories in international cooperation of the 20th century. Uh, alongside the green revolution in agriculture, smallpox eradication, and the battle to reduce infant and young child mortality, uh, it is among the things of which the global community can be proudest. And more, most recently, uh, I think that the HIV AIDS pandemic and the, and the, global the, the effective global response to it uh, can be added to that list. And, and I just put up here parenthetically, uh, is the global response to COVID-19 going to be the next case of a global success story um, in international cooperation? However, I also believe that our collective inability uh, to mount uniformly effective programs um, starting back in the 1960s means that we failed to prevent global population from more than doubling from the 3 billion or so that we saw uh, in, the, in the 1950s uh, to almost 8 billion today and what will inevitably be uh, at least 10 and perhaps as, as much as 11 billion before it all finally levels out at the end of, of, the, of the current century. And I conclude by saying that I believe that today's environmental crisis, that the crisis of global warming is surely a direct consequence of this failure, this failure to act quickly enough once the crisis was recognized. The human footprint is clearly the cause of the sixth extinction that we're witnessing today, which scientists and anthropologists are calling the Anthropocene. That is uh, the um, extinction caused by human action and human behavior. I'm going to end it there to thank you for your attention and to open it up for what I hope will be uh, 20 or 30 or 40 minutes of questions. So thank you very much. And thank you, Steve. Um, please um, type your questions, you know. Oh, there is one to me directly from Brian Dalton. Okay. 
Bucharest hosting a population conference is eerie in light of Ceausescu's draconian prohibitions on any birth control or abortion. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting observation. Um, I think that the Bucharest conference occurred before Ceausescu so abruptly changed uh, Romania's <coughs> population policy. Yes. Um, uh, Ceausescu um, became um, alarmed at the uh, extraordinarily high rate of abortion that was going on in Romania. <clears throat> um, it, it, in fact, throughout the, uh, the Soviet era and the, the era of, uh, of communist domination of Eastern Europe in the Iron Curtain, uh, abortion was far and away the principal means of birth control um, in the socialist uh, bloc countries. Uh, but in Romania, it was so severe that, and, and so many women uh, were dying from uh, unsafe abortions as well as losing um, uh, the, the, uh, their, the, the children, the unborn children, that um, Ceausescu uh, put in place a, a really, as, as uh, you said, a draconian um, population uh, control policy, uh, uh, policy in reverse of outlawing abortion. Uh, and the result was uh, millions of maternal deaths. I don't know if it was millions, but certainly hundreds of thousands of maternal deaths among women who could not gain access to safe abortion, who just turned to unsafe abortion. And one, I, I have to editorialize here, one has to worry about whether we're headed in that direction in a, in a country that is uh, more and more uh, denying women access to safe abortion in, in the states. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for perhaps more discussion. Uh, and then another question from Brian Dalton, a, a, a direct one to me says, does not the focus on fertility rates mask the absolute growth in population worldwide and its effects, especially environmental? Well, I think in fact, I've answered that. You did, you did, thank in you. The latter part of the, of the talk. From Lisa Kissel, um, can I talk more about the China and one child policy, how long it lasted and what the consequences were? With pleasure. Um, China enunciated the, the, um, the one child policy, as I, as I mentioned on the slides, in a, in a dramatic flip flop from the position it had long taken, uh, the, the traditional Marxian position. Um, in, in the late 1970s, around 1980, um, and what it did was to um, uh, instruct uh, political leaders at the provincial level uh, to undertake the measures that they felt needed to be undertaken to ensure uh, that no couple had more than one child. Uh, there were exceptions, of course. Uh, th this was much more uh, strictly enforced in the urban areas than it was in the rural areas, understanding that farmers needed larger families than ur urban dwellers did. Uh, it did not apply at all to uh, Communist Party officials, um, but it was carried out with remarkable efficiency, uh, including forced sterilizations, forced abortions, uh, forced insertions of intrauterine devices, um, regular monitoring, uh, the, uh, the exacting of, of great penalties on people who uh, exceeded the, the birth quotas. It, it was, it was a, uh, a totalitarian attack on fertility, and it was as effective as totalitarian, totalitarian societies can be when they go after something with, uh, with, with such vigor. Um, Interestingly, in, in my own experience, um, as China opened up uh, after Mao's death and as things began to change in China and as Westerners began to have access and to begin to talk to the Chinese, I, I began to learn um, through my um, International Planned Parenthood uh, connections uh, that there were many Chinese demographers uh, and many officials in the State Family Planning Commission who were alarmed at the speed at which fertility was declining uh, and concerned that China was on a trajectory to overshoot the mark, to go to uh, 
to, to dive so far below replacement level fertility uh, that this was going to become a real problem for China going forward. They were also deeply concerned about the terrible uh, uh, um, uh, change in, in the sex ratio that, that was occurring as girl children were being aborted or um, in some cases uh, murdered. Uh, in, 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 in hugely disproportional numbers. Uh, so that the age, not only the, 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 the sex uh, um, distribution of the population uh, was radically altered. Uh, so not only was population going down too fast, but there were far too few women surviving uh, to the reproductive ages. And the demographers were concerned about this. Um, the vice chairman of the State Family Planning Commission happened to be on the governing council of International Planned Parenthood. China was a member of IPPF. Uh, and I, I had long conversations with her in which she bemoaned what was going on and encouraged me when I visited China to speak to the authorities about, uh, about these concerns, which I did, uh, but it fell entirely on deaf ears. And it really wasn't until about five years ago uh, the Chinese policy began to change. The, the members of the Politburo were remarkably resistant to any kind of scientific argumentation. Sound familiar? Um, and, um, and, and so the, the consequence of this is that China has overshot the mark. It's fallen off a demographic cliff of sorts. Uh, and, uh, and the Chinese authorities now are very worried about where the labor force will come from to sustain uh, the, the economic engine that they have created. Uh, it's an open question. Uh, whether China is going to be able to maintain um, anything like its, its current uh, level of economic performance, given how the labor force is, um, uh, is, is diminishing, uh, and given that China has not uh, turned as Europe did uh, in an earlier time to replacement level migration uh, and to uh, using uh, imported labor uh, to substitute for that which is being lost through the low fertility of the, of the indigenous population. Uh, from Lee Allen, would you like to comment on resource use per capita versus population growth as an ongoing challenge? The, the, the developing countries have always argued uh, that instead of focusing on their population growth, we should be equally focused on our own overconsumption of resources. Uh, and that is an absolutely valid and fair argument for them to have put forward. The, uh, the, the environmental concerns uh, that, the that the world faces um, are, uh, are, are certainly in very large measure the consequence of the way in which we use, uh, we use resources. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the um, the, 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 the simple growth in numbers by itself uh, is multiplied uh, in, a, in a famous formula that, that Paul Ehrlich, in fact, uh, devised uh, by the rate at, at which these large and growing numbers um, consume resources. Um, certainly, um, China's footprint uh, in, in terms of um, global warming is far greater today as a consequence of its um, prosperity uh, than it would be had China remained uh, as poor as it was uh, before um, uh, the, the, the reforms that followed uh, the death of, of Chairman Mao. Um, and so it, it's uh, you know the the uh, the environmental consequences of rapid population growth are uh, multiplied many times by the consumption behavior of human beings, and to argue that all of uh, of, of the environmental problems we face today are because of rapid population growth would be a misstatement and a vast oversimplification. Um, but surely, uh, if we had half as many people on Earth as we do. Uh, the environment would be in a lot better shape than it is. 
and uh, and so you know how how much of the of, of of the environmental damage to attribute to consumption behavior and how much to attribute to rapid population growth um, is is something we could debate. But I think what we can all agree on is that both are responsible. Okay, we have a question from Perez. Um, is the two point one fertility rate adjusted if life expectancy increases or decreases? decreases. Yeah, 2.1 um, is the number that is based on um, the, uh, the basically the child survival rate uh, or the or the rate of infant mortality, infant and young child mortality. 2.1 is the is the is the replacement level um, given that a certain number of uh, of children who are born uh, don't survive uh, to age five, <clears throat> uh, if if every child uh, did survive to age five, uh, then replacement level would 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 be two, uh, but it's slightly above two because of infant and young child mortality. Uh, the higher the infant and young child mortality rate, the higher the number above two uh, replacement level is. So that in some African countries in which uh, replacement level, uh, infant mortality is still very high. Replacement level might be 2.3. Bruce McClory. Yeah, Bruce has a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question, Steve, is whether there's any consensus uh, on the linkage between population growth rates and the inequality of wealth and incomes, either within countries or between countries, what is that linkage of quality and population growth? It's a it's a great question, uh, Bruce. And there was a time uh, ten years ago when I could have answered you much more intelligently than I can today. Uh, it's, it's it's been a it's been a while since I uh, was as as familiar with that literature as uh, as I was. I'm, I'm not as as familiar today as I as I once was. Um, I think the answer, the, 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 first, the, the beginning answer to your question is yes, there is, uh, there, there is definitely a linkage um, <clears throat> um, with a very high uh, fertility rate. Um, it is very difficult for people in the lower part of the income distribution to escape poverty. It, 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 it just, and, and they're stuck. Uh, in, in this low level equilibrium trap um, <clears throat> for, for, for generations. Um, de economist demographers, uh, and there's a, there, there, there are two at Harvard, uh, David Bloom and David Can Canning, have done a lot of work on, uh, on, on the relationship between um, fertility change and economic performance. And what they have discovered is that um, when um, fertility begins to decline rapidly, uh, a country uh, enters a, a window of opportunity for economic development. As the, as the size of the, de of, the, of the dependent population relative to the working age population diminishes, that is, as there are fewer young people and not yet many old people during the demographic transition, uh, there is a real opportunity for a country to take a giant leap forward economically. Uh, and that's the story of the Asian tigers. Mm. Uh, Korea and Taiwan and Thailand and, and many, many of the, uh, Singapore is a, is a classic example, uh, made tremendous leaps because they got their population growth rates under control and at the same time initiated uh, economic policies and social and economic policies that were really conducive to economic development and, 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 and bringing an entire uh, segment of the population out of poverty. Korea is perhaps the most dramatic case of that, uh, that, that, that we know of. And interestingly, uh, during much the same period or, or only a few years later, as Latin America went through its own demographic transition, very few of those countries took advantage of that window of opportunity in the way that the Asians had. 
Uh, and the Chinese, of course, are, are a classic example of how a country that uh, that, that manages successfully and quickly to reduce its fertility can experience a tremendous economic burst of, of, of growth. And that usually is accompanied by an improvement in income distribution as well. Certainly has been in the case of the Asian countries. So I, I don't know if that really answers your question because there, there certainly are cases of countries which have experienced declines in fertility and haven't seen much improvement in income distribution. I think income distribution is a function of many factors and population is only one of them, uh, but it can make a big difference, uh, et cetera, as paribus. I, I didn't hear, I haven't heard much discussion uh, our, uh, of the Arab world and, and some of the other Middle Eastern countries. How, how does the strata across of North Africa and, uh, and the Middle East fit into these population issues? Well, what, what, part of what lies behind that question is, is there, is there a relationship between Islam and um, fertility? Um, and um, the answer appears to be no. Uh, some of the countries that have been most successful um, are, um, uh, are, are Islamic countries, not all of them Arab. Um, for example, Iran. Uh, had a spectacularly successful family planning program after the revolution. Not immediately after the revolution, a few years later, um, but uh, just a remarkable decline in fertility when the government decided that this was an important thing to do and offered family planning services really in, in quite a non-coercive way. Indonesia has been very successful uh, in, in, in this area. As far as the, the Arab countries of, of uh, North Africa and the Middle East are concerned, it's highly variable. Um, Lebanon has very low fertility. I mentioned Tunisia and, and Morocco. Egypt has struggled with the issue and, and, and depending on, uh, the, on the regime and power and, and, and the, the government's priorities, sometimes uh, they've done very well and at other times they have struggled. Saudi Arabia has, uh, has always had very high fertility and that's, what, that's just fine with them. Um, so, um, it, 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 it's hard to generalize, Ed, uh, and, and it, the, the, um, the oil-rich countries, generally speaking, have not worried much about the issue, and uh, because they haven't, and because they haven't done much about family planning and their health services, um, fertility has tended to be relatively high in countries like Iraq, uh, Syria, um, and um, Saudi Arabia. We have a question from Brian Dalton. Can you describe the history of how population control advocacy by the West was perceived by the South as racist? <clears throat> it, it was very much perceived that way, um, uh, particularly uh, in Africa and, and still is. Um, to the extent that Western countries um, urge the African countries to adopt population policies. Uh, the, uh, the concern about, about racism and, uh, and the allegation of, of, of racism <clears throat> inevitably um, uh, follows quickly. But I would say that uh, whereas at the time of the Bucharest conference, uh, it was predominant uh, among the um, the, 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 the formerly colonial power, uh, colonial countries, colonies, um, that has diminished very significantly with the passage of time. What, what happened in that golden age of family planning was that following all of the rhetoric and the politics of, of Bucharest, they began one after another to understand that doing something to address very high rates of population growth was in their self-interest. Uh, and as that perception changed, racism became uh, less a, a concern and, and certainly less pronounced uh, in public discussion uh, than, it, than it had been earlier. Lynn um, asked to, I guess, go back to Perez's question um, about longevity and population growth. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the question means, but maybe, maybe this would help a little bit. Um, when the death rate rapidly declines, 
Um, it is overwhelmingly driven by reduces, reductions in infant and young child mortality. It has, it's much less affected by increases in life expectancy at age five, say, as opposed to life expectancy at age zero. Um, <clears throat> and I, the, um, it, it, certainly that uh, at, as um, um, infant and young child mortality reduce, and the death rate declines, uh, and um, uh, a, a country begins to experience greater prosperity, um, life expectancy, that is the, 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 the median age at death, uh, begins to rise. Um, and uh, what happens is that the early stages of the demographic transition, almost all of the improvement in the death rate is driven by infant and young child mortality. But as you reach the latter stages of the demographic transition and the death rate begins to flatten out, most of the improvement in the death rate that, that continues is a consequence of uh, increased uh, uh, longevity. Um, <clears throat> so it's a, um, I, I don't know if that answers the question because I'm not exactly sure what the question uh, was asking, but, uh, but that, that tends to be how it works out. Uh, it, it, it's hard to overstate the contribution that infant and young child mortality makes to the decline in the death rate. Uh, it, it's, it, because it's, it's overwhelmingly the most important factor. Bill Friedman has a question. Yes. So within, within country, and he's still awake at what what time is it, Bill? <laughs> almost two. Almost two in the morning in Haifa. Within countries, there is always or almost always an inverse correlation between family income and birth rate. Are there exceptions? And if there are, what would account for them? Ah, good. I'm really glad you raised that question because I didn't get into as much as I would have liked to the interplay between development and family planning. Uh, I talked about the great debate, um, but what that debate was really about was the extent to which fertility decline is a function of improvements in living standards and to what extent it's a function of women having, uh, or couples having agency over their reproduction. Um, and the, the, the debate has gone on for, for years and I finally come to the conclusion uh, that it, it's about 50-50. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, but um, let, me, let me just tell a, 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 a couple of anecdotes. Um, Bangladesh uh, was the poorest country on earth. It was famous because Henry Kissinger called it an international basket case uh, in its, in, in its uh, years immediately following independence from Pakistan. Um, Bangladesh uh, was the classic case to say, well, if you put in a really good family planning program, would it make any difference? The sociologists and the economists looked at Bangladesh and they said, no matter what you do about family planning, these couples are living in circumstances in which it makes no sense for them to have family planning. They need children to replace those that die. They need children to work with them. Uh, in the on their small plots of land, uh, and um, you know, for, so forget about it. The, the fact is that when Bangladesh decided to get serious about having a family planning program, what they discovered, lo and behold, is that what demographers and sociologists and economists were saying about the men might be true, it was not true about, about the women. The women actually did not want to be continue in a continuous state of childbearing. Uh, and given the opportunity to do something about it, if they couldn't get their husbands to agree, they would do it surreptitiously. Uh, and if they could, could get their husbands to agree, fertility came down and it came down quite dramatically. There was a famous experiment done in Bangladesh in, in Matlab Tana or, or district uh, of the country, which demonstrated that if you made family planning services available in an effective way, that is through the health system, in a, in a way that also addressed the, 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 the health and well-being of children, uh, that, that couples would be very interested in using those services. 
And it was so successful that the that the it be, it became the, the 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 model for the national program became became the the, the system that was used uh, countrywide. And Bangladesh is one of the great success stories of family planning in a country which not only uh, was successful in family planning, but because it was successful in family planning, began to dig itself out of a state of extreme poverty uh, on a national basis. Uh, so there the situation was reversed. Do family planning well and you can get yourself out of poverty as opposed to reduce poverty and the birth rate will take care of itself. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, there are many countries where improvements in living standards even in the absence of, uh, of strong family planning programs have seen birth rates decline as in fact, women have alternatives to childbearing, they, they have employment outside of the home, uh, they have access to education uh, and, uh, and, and, and a decent paying job. I mean, we all know that with urbanization and with, uh, with, with employment opportunities, um, what uh, the, the, the role of women changes quite dramatically uh, in families and, and in society. So um, the answer to the question is that, that, that obviously both are important factors in reducing fertility. I think the general social and economic development is, is the driving force, but the better a country does in providing family planning services, the faster that decline in fertility will occur and the shorter the demographic transition will be. Lynn asks if you could talk about climate refugees. Nope. <laughs> I mean, not with any intelligence. Uh, I, it, it, it just not, not a subject I, I really know much about. International migration is not my, uh, my forte. I, I wish I knew more about it. I wish I had time to, um, to devote a, a, as, as, as much attention to this as I, as I do to fertility and mortality. Um, I, I, and I, I, you know, I know a fair amount of, um, uh, of economically driven migration, international migration or refugees, uh, economic refugees and political refugees. I know much less really about climate refugees. Maybe there's somebody else uh, on, on, on this Zoom uh, who knows more about that subject I, because I, I feel inadequate in uh, my inability to answer that question, but I, I just, uh, it catches me a bit flat-footed. I wanna thank you, Steve, um, for, for a wonderful lecture. Um, and I wanna thank everyone here for joining us. Um, thank you for your continued support uh, in participating in our programs and, and for your financial support as well. We really, truly appreciate it. Um, I hope to see you it, um, in May when we start back up with um, our summer lectures and I wish you all a good night. <laughs>